Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases, especially written, for people learning English. Today on the program, you will hear from Mario Ritter Jr., Pete Musto, and Susan Shand. Later, we will present our American history series, The Making of a Nation. But first, here is Mario Ritter Jr. Many people around the United States are wondering what will happen next now that a report on Russian interference in the 2016 presidential election has been completed. Special Counsel Robert Mueller gave the report to U.S. Attorney General William Barr on Friday. Barr, who was appointed by President Donald Trump and approved by Congress last February, then released his outline of the report's main findings on Sunday. In his summary, Barr said, the report does not recommend any further indictments. Barr also wrote that the special counsel's office made no secret charges that have yet to be made public. His office continues to study the report to see how much of it can be released to the public. The report, Barr said, was divided into two parts. The first part, looked at Russia's interference in the 2016 presidential election. It found that a number of Russian nationals and organizations used the Internet to spread disinformation and to incite social conflict. It also found that Russian government actors hacked into computers in the U.S. to gather or spread information to influence the election. Barr explained that investigators also aimed to understand if anyone connected with Trump's campaign committed a crime by joining Russian efforts to influence the election. Barr quoted the report as saying, The investigation did not establish that members of the Trump campaign conspired or coordinated with the Russian government in its election interference activities. Barr said the report also looked at concerns that Trump had obstructed justice, in other words, attempted to block legal investigations. On this question, the Attorney General said the report did not say the President was guilty, but it did not say he was innocent either. Instead, it sets out evidence on both sides of the question. Then the special counsel wrote that, while this report does not conclude that the President committed a crime, it also does not exonerate him. However, Barr said he, the Deputy Attorney General, and other top Justice Department officials had concluded that the special counsel did not provide enough evidence to charge the President with a crime. Many different reactions to the completion of the report and Barr's comments were voiced over the weekend. Supporters of Trump said the report showed that the president and his campaign were not guilty of what has been called collusion, a secret agreement with the Russians. Trump tweeted on Sunday that the result meant that he did not hide anything, block anything, and was cleared of wrongdoing. Opposition members critical of the president have called for all of the report to be released to the public. They also point to other investigations of Trump, his family, and associates. 
House Speaker Nancy Pelosi and Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer, both Democratic Party leaders, released a joint statement. It said Attorney General Barr's letter raised as many questions as it answers. They also said Barr was not fair or objective in his findings. Democratic Party Representative Jerry Nadler of New York said he would call for Barr to testify before the House Judiciary Committee on the issue. The investigation has been the subject of fierce debate between the political parties in Washington. It also has brought into question the fairness of news reporting on the issue and proved deeply divisive in areas like social media. Acting Attorney General Rod Rosenstein ordered the investigation into Russian interference in May 2017. The timing of the move raised questions because it happened soon after Trump fired former Federal Bureau of Investigation Director James Comey. Rosenstein has remained as the Deputy Attorney General, but has said he will step down soon. Defenders of Mueller's investigation say he has carried out the order fully. The special counsel received nearly 500 search orders, requested evidence of 13 foreign governments, and questioned about 500 witnesses. As a result, Mueller charged 25 Russians with wrongdoing related to interference. He also brought charges against six aides and advisors to the Trump presidential campaign. Trump's first national security advisor, Michael Flynn, resigned and admitted to lying to investigators. Trump's one-time campaign manager, Paul Manafort, was found guilty of avoiding taxes and lying on bank statements. On Monday, the Trump administration signaled that it is up to Barr and the Justice Department to decide what details of the investigation can be released to the public. I'm Mario Ritter, Jr. Researchers warn that many young women know little about the risks they face of cardiovascular or heart disease. But a new study suggests women may be able to reduce those risks by doing light physical activity as they age. Heart disease remains the top cause of death for women in the United States. Yet only one in ten young women reported knowing that fact. And fewer than one in twenty believed heart disease was the leading health problem for women. These are the findings of a study that questioned 331 women between the ages of 15 and 24 about heart disease. The study asked women what they knew about heart attacks and heart failure and how to prevent them. The researchers then compared the results to a 2012 opinion study of 1,227 women above age 25. The Journal of the American Heart Association published the recent findings earlier this month. Holly Gooding and Courtney Brown, both of Harvard University Medical School, are the authors of the study. They told the Reuters news service that more than half of all adult women are aware that heart disease is the biggest health threat they face. So, the authors said they were surprised that younger women were not aware of it even women with access to health care. 
In the short term, young women have a low risk for diseases of the heart and blood vessels. However, the lifetime risk is high, the authors added. And there is clear evidence that issues traditionally linked to heart disease risk, such as high blood pressure, begin in childhood and early adulthood. The authors argue that young adults usually focus on the present and do not think long term, which might partly explain the results. Claire Dovernoy started the Women's Heart Program at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. She was not involved in the study, but she agrees with the authors. That's just the way that adolescents tend to be, and that's a barrier to an education like this, where the risk is more of a long-term thing, said Dovernoy. She advises young women to focus on the benefits they will get now, while they are young, from a healthy lifestyle. The authors believe the most effective way to improve cardiovascular health is by dealing with conditions that increase risks before signs of heart disease develop. But supporting awareness of heart health among young people can be difficult as they do not usually discuss cardiovascular disease with their doctors. What is needed, the authors say, is a solution that works in several ways. This includes improving health education in schools, training doctors that treat children, and supporting heart health on the Internet. But even if they have not completely prepared for the risk of heart disease, older women need not worry that they have completely missed their chance. A new study suggests that increasing the number of hours they spend doing things like walking and gardening may reduce that risk. Out of nearly 6,000 older women, those doing the most daily low-intensity activity were much less likely to experience a heart attack or die from heart disease than those who did the least. And every extra hour of light activity per day seemed to cut women's risk even further. These are the findings of the study which the JAMA Network Open published, also in March. Andrea LaCroix, director of the Women's Health Center of Excellence at the University of California, San Diego, is the study's lead author. She noted that current physical activity guidelines suggest 150 minutes a week of somewhat intense physical activity. But even that is very difficult for older women like those in the study whose average age was 79. The bottom line in this study is that everything we do, even lower intensity physical activities, looks beneficial to the heart. The current guidelines, LaCroix said, were developed by people who were not studying older women. Yet older women disproportionately experience heart disease. For the new study, LaCroix and her team worked with 5,861 women, ages 63 to 99. Researchers asked them to wear a device called an accelerometer for one week. The device recorded when the woman sat or leaned back and when they got up and moved around. It was also able to report on the intensity of the women's activities. On average, women in the most active group spent more than 5.6 hours per day in light activity. The least active group spent less than 3.9 hours a day doing something other than sitting or lying down. Over the next four years, there were 143 new heart attacks and deaths 
from heart disease and 570 new cases of cardiovascular disease among the women in the study. The researchers took into consideration qualities such as the women's age, race, blood pressure, and whether or not they smoked cigarettes. They found that women spending the most hours in light activity were 42% less likely to have heart attacks or die from heart disease compared to the least active women. The most active women were also 22% less likely to develop new cardiovascular disease. The study did not include a control group. Therefore, it cannot prove that light activity directly reduces women's cardiovascular risk. But Elsa Giardina still called the study very important. She is the director of the Center for Women's Health at the New York Presbyterian Columbia University Irving Medical Center. Giardina said the study shows that women can lower their risk of heart disease simply by spending less time sitting. She notes that the study also includes a population that is underrepresented in a lot of studies, even though older women are one of the fastest growing populations in the United States. I'm Susan Shand. And I'm Pete Musto. Welcome to The Making of a Nation, American History in VOA Special English. In the presidential election of 1888, one issue that played a major part was tariffs. At that time, import taxes were high on many products. The high tariffs protected American goods from competing with lower-priced foreign imports. The tariffs protected millions of jobs in American industry. Not everyone, however, supported high tariffs. The President of the United States, Grover Cleveland, decided that high tariffs were wrong. He told other Democratic leaders that he would try to get the tariffs reduced. The politicians warned him not to try. They said he would only lose the support of business people. They said he would need campaign money from business if he expected to be elected president again. But Cleveland rejected their advice. Shirley Griffith and Ray Freeman tell about the presidential election of 1888. <laughs> President Cleveland believed that high tariffs hurt more Americans than they protected. High tariffs, he said, led to high prices on all products. He also opposed high tariffs because they brought in more money than the government needed. The extra money was kept in the public treasury, and this, Cleveland believed, slowed the American economy. The president's Democratic Party united to support his policy of lowering tariffs. When the party held its presidential nominating convention in 1888, delegates quickly renominated Cleveland. At the Republican Party convention, delegates were expected to nominate Senator James Blaine. Blaine had been the party's candidate four years earlier. He had lost to Cleveland in a very close election. Senator Blaine publicly criticized the president's policy on tariffs. He said he looked forward to a full debate on the issue. Republicans thought this meant that Blaine wanted to be nominated for president again. They told him he was sure to win. 
They said it would be such an easy victory that he would not have to campaign. In fact, Blaine did not want the nomination. He asked that his name not be put before the convention. He met with reporters to talk about his decision. He said, A man who has once been the candidate of his party and defeated owes it to his party not to be a candidate again. Many Republicans refused to accept Blaine's decision. They felt that if Blaine were nominated, he would run. Blaine replied, If the presidential nomination is offered to me, I could not and would not accept it. That was final. Blaine's supporters had to find someone else to nominate for president. Fourteen men declared themselves to be candidates for the Republican nomination. A leading candidate was Senator John Sherman of Ohio. Another was former Senator Benjamin Harrison of Indiana. Convention delegates voted several times. No man received enough votes to win the nomination. Then a message came from James Blaine. It said, Nominate Harrison. On the eighth vote, the delegates did. Benjamin Harrison was the grandson of the ninth President of the United States, William Henry Harrison. Benjamin was a lawyer. He had been a general in the Union Army during America's Civil War of the 1860s. After nominating Harrison, the Republicans approved a strong policy statement on the tariff question. The statement said, We fully support the American system of protection. President Cleveland and his party serve the interests of Europe. We would support the interests of America. We would see all other taxes ended before we surrender any part of the protective tariff system. Benjamin Harrison's campaign was well organized. His campaign workers went to businessmen who had become rich because of high protective tariffs. They asked for support, and the businessmen gave millions of dollars to the campaign. The businessmen also put pressure on the people who worked for them. They warned workers that if Cleveland were re-elected, there might be no more jobs. Republican Party leaders took an active part in the campaign of 1888. They made speeches and led parades across the country. The party also printed millions of pamphlets that warned against what it called Cleveland's free trade policies. Grover Cleveland's campaign was not well organized. It started slowly. It did not raise much money. No effort was made to answer Republican attacks on the tariff issue. And the president himself refused to campaign. He said he had more important things to do. The Democrats also failed to stop the Republicans from buying votes on Election Day. In Indiana, for example, men were paid $15 to vote for the Republican candidate. The Democrats bought votes, too, but they had less money to spend than the Republicans. When the popular votes were counted, Cleveland had about 100,000 more than Harrison. But Harrison had more electoral votes. He won the election. Grover Cleveland had mixed feelings about his defeat. He wanted to win because he believed his policies were best for the country. He said he was not sorry that he had made tariffs the major issue in the campaign. I do not regret it, he said. It is better to be defeated battling for an honest idea 
than to win by a cowardly trick. When President Cleveland and his wife left the White House, Mrs. Cleveland said goodbye to the servants. She told one of them, I want you to take good care of all the furniture and other things in the house. I want to find everything the same when we come back four years from now. The new president, Benjamin Harrison, had big political debts to repay. He understood this when he began organizing his administration. When I came to power, Harrison said, I found that my party's leaders had taken all the power for themselves. I could not name my own cabinet. They had sold every cabinet position to pay for the election. The position of Secretary of State went to James Blaine, who had refused his party's requests to run for president. Blaine had served as Secretary of State under Presidents James Garfield and Chester Arthur. The position of Postmaster General went to John Wanamaker. Wanamaker had raised most of the money for Harrison's campaign. He had given $50,000 of his own money. He planned to repay party supporters with jobs in the post office department. During the campaign, Harrison had promised to enforce the civil service law that protected the job rights of government workers. He promised that workers would be removed only in the interests of better government. Wanamaker and other party leaders criticized Harrison. They said they could not build a strong party organization without promising government jobs to voters. So President Harrison suspended the civil service laws that protected postal workers. Within a year, 30,000 Democrats were removed from the department. Their jobs went to Republicans. The president then announced that the post office would once again be protected by the civil service laws. Former President Cleveland had been troubled by the extra money in the federal treasury. This was tax money the government collected but did not use. Most of the extra money came from high protective tariffs on imported products. Cleveland wanted to reduce the surplus by reducing the tariffs. President Harrison decided to reduce the surplus too, but he would do it by increasing government spending, not by cutting taxes. Congress agreed. It became the first Congress to spend $1,000 million. Much of the money was spent on payments to men who had fought in the Union Army during the Civil War. These payments cost the government more than $100 million a year. Congress also approved millions of dollars for government projects in the home states of important congressmen. This was called pork barrel spending. It paid for new roads, bridges, and government buildings, for almost anything the congressman wanted. Congress reduced the surplus even more by approving money to build coastal defenses and to buy warships for the Navy. The American Congress passed several historic pieces of legislation during Benjamin Harrison's administration. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson.